This is the Wealth Ability for CPAs show. Better clients, better practice, better life. Here's Tom Wheelwright. So probably the biggest issue that everybody in the CPA profession is aware of is the shortage of good accounting students, good accounting professionals. It's so hard um, to fill our ranks these days. There's more and more demand for our services and yet fewer and fewer um, accountants entering the profession. And that is what we're gonna learn about today is why is that happening? What is driving the CPA labor shortage? Um, what does it mean for our business down the road? Um, I have my own views. You, you've heard some of my views before. Today, we have uh, Dr. Paul Madsen from the University of Florida, an accounting professor. So he's right there in the front lines when the students are coming in and he's hearing what they say. So Paul, it's really, really good to have somebody that's, that's getting it right when they're starting out. Um, uh, but tell us a little bit about your, you know, your experience at the University of Florida and what you teach down there. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm uh, the the Deloitte Association uh, professor of accounting at the University of Florida. I'm an associate professor. I most of my time I spend doing research, um, and I do research on the labor supply in accounting. Oh. Uh, I I teach my uh, mostly um, introduction to financial accounting, but to MBA students and other master's students. Um, right. So, okay. Perfect. So we we do have the right guy here. This is great. Um, and uh, uh, Paul and I actually share um, a, a heritage. We grew up in uh, in Utah, so um, we we discovered that uh, earlier today. So um, really good to have another uh, Ute. Um, uh, I know you're at the University of Florida, but I know you you've got to be red and white at heart. Um, so here's here's the big question. So why, in in your opinion, what you're seeing? Why are young people not going into the accounting profession? So I, I have kind of a short answer and a long answer. The, the short answer is that entry level pay is too low, and I, I think that's the biggest problem. But the the longer answer involves how is it possible to have a market where the price does not adapt to imbalances <laughs> in supply and demand? Because the story the story that you get from kind of the press and the standard story gets you to the point where you say, well, the price is too low; they're not paying enough, but um, only recently has I have I gotten gotten to the point where I can begin to answer why why doesn't the market work? Yeah, that's that's an interesting one. So the first thing I'm going to ask you is, okay, so wh what do you see as the entry late entry pay level? What is it? I mean, you've done research in this area, and what should it be? Yeah, well, so it's um it should be whatever makes supply equal demand <laughs> and like that that's kind of basic econ theory and I, I think the best way to kind of empirically try to measure that is what are other people with similar educations and backgrounds exactly. earning and uh the best data i saw and i've seen on that that's recent and up to date came from the wall street journal which has been writing articles about the problem for yeah. a while and um so they have a nice graph in one of the recent articles by one of my favorites i gotta get her name so uh, by Lindsay Ellis. So they get some census data and it's like young entry-level accountants are making like $56,000 a year, but then they list a bunch of other kind of similar business um, occupations and they're making like 75 to, I guess 75 is kind of the top, but they've all been growing. So the, the, the pay has been going up over the last 10 years, except for uh, accountants. So, all right. So I'm I'm going to bite. Um, yes. <laughs> why, why, why hasn't, why hasn't the pay in, in your opinion, and I mean, I'll share mine afterwards because yeah. I have my own thoughts on this, but in your opinion, why, why hasn't the pay been going up? How, why has it been inelastic? Okay. Yeah. So I, I love this question. This is a research question and that's what I do. I, I, I try to do research. So there's a bunch of hypotheses out there and I think many of them are not kind of supportable. My short answer is it looks a lot like an oligopoly, uh, or really an oligopsony to me, oh. uh, which we can talk about. There's there's market power. Oh, the 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 big four control kind of the the majority of the entry level market. Oh, um, it's the prestigious place to be, and I don't think they're setting wages competitively. I I owe a lot of this thinking to a guy named Martin Schmaltz, who's the chief economist oh. of the PCAOB, who um, did a really good presentation on this recently at a conference. So, so they've done a really good job of saying we're the best 
um, which they yes. have. Okay. Yes. Like, like you, if you, like when I, I graduated from university of Texas 40 some odd years ago and with a master's degree and um, th there was no question. I mean, it was it, 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 at the time it was big eight, same thing though. Right. So, so you're going to one of these, these top firms or, I mean, why would you, why wouldn't you, you're, you know, yeah. you're, you came out of the top school. So at the time, University of Texas, uh, I think it still is the top still tax, tax school um, in the country. And you're coming out of the top school. Why would you go anywhere? But um, you know, the, the big four accounting firms right. And at, when I started, so so to put this in perspective, and this does put it in a little per, bit of perspective. So when I started, the average salary with a master's degree was right around twenty thousand, right around twenty thousand. So I think I started around twenty two. I was a little higher than average, and um, and I think I got one offer at twenty six, um, which I turned down just because of of firm and location. But um, and, and it didn't change much. I mean, this is the other thing. So. Uh, I actually spent, you know, I was two years uh, in the Salt Lake City office. Then I went to the national office. So you'd think I'm going to the national office, Washington, D.C. Oh, great. Big pay raise. Nope. So even in Washington, D.C., my pay was like 30 some odd thousand dollars. That's all it was. Right. And then when I came back out and I came back to, to Phoenix, it, it went up a little bit, but not very much. So what I found was, is that it was just a very slow growth. So what happened was a lot of my a lot of my friends were leaving the profession to go work in industry. And of course right. the challenge there was, is they'd get a big raise, but then they'd be capped. It's kind of like being a yeah. professor, right? Yeah. <laughs> you, you can make all this money being a professor because you've got all this demand, but then your raises just aren't that much. And so really that was always the choice. What do I do? Do I do this or do I, you know, do I do that? And so I've always, and, and now I have a different theory. And I think this is interesting uh, because I think that the big, you're right. The big four have uh, on the top talent, they really have owned the top talent. Right. And if you really want to go in, then that's where you go. On top of that, it seems like, you know, people have a different, have other options. So the same people who would come into the accounting profession might go into the, the technology profession or might go into right. financial services. And both of those pay way more yeah. than the accounting profession. I mean, the technology is, it's more than double. Right than the accounting profession, and um, I heard fifty six thousand. Going, oh, I wish I could find somebody at fifty six thousand. I, I mean, I, I don't think we pay anybody under eighty thousand, seventy, seventy to eighty thousand dollars. But um, at the same time, we we have a different philosophy. So one uh, here, so here's my theory. So okay. hear this out. My theory is we don't pay enough because we don't charge enough, and we don't charge enough because we don't do enough. For the clients. So one of the issues is, is that we have done a terrific job of commoditizing our profession. Yeah. So we've taken financial statements, audits, tax returns, and we've said, look, it's all the same. And instead of, because we're not good salespeople, instead of distinguishing ourselves, we've gone and said, well, we'll compete on price. So now literally I have franchisees Okay, now we're going to change this. They just became franchisees. But I have franchisees that are charging less than H&R Block. Mm -hmm. I'm going, how, how are you ever going to hire people? I said, look, you, you got to pay a lot more if, if you're going to get the best people. But if you get the best people, you can actually do so much more and you can actually make so much more money. So, it's, yeah. it's, so, so that's, that's kind of the way I'm looking at it. Yeah, I, I've heard. I mean, I think that that is something that's shared by uh, a bunch of academics. We at, at the University of Florida, um, we have a guy who's an audit specialist, Robert Neckel, who has been recently arguing that the, the big audit firms, really any of the kind of professional service firms that are big partnerships need to reconsider their business model because it's outdated and it's not gonna work yep. into the future. That I'm less of an expert on that though. I'm more like an entry level kind of guy. I, I've always been more interested in the kind of rank and file people than in kind of the executives and so, the so, so let me ask you a question about rank and file because I, I have a yeah. I have another theory here. So this is this is a great place to test out my theories with, with somebody <laughs> okay. who's actually in it um on at, at, at that level. Um so I think with the current generation, I think they're not so interested in working long hours for low wages in a back office job. And what I'm seeing is and this is why we went the franchise route. 
Um, we could have been a big firm. We could have been a, bit, been a big national firm. We're one of the top marketing uh, firms in the country. And we decided against it. And we first went to a network version that 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 um, that proved that that actually proved the prove that we would be better off with a franchise. Um, but the idea of the franchise is everybody's an owner. So you have small firms, independent owners, kind of like uh, small independently owned restaurants that just share a system, right? And they right. they might share some common ownership, but they're really independently run, owned, and operated. And and what we've had over the last, since the 1990s, since American Express, is we've had this huge consolidation of the accounting profession, which I think has actually hurt the profession. Yeah. So I, I kind of like your thoughts on, on that, that consolidation and what you see happening. Um, and, and do you see that when you talk to the uh, your young students, are they wanting to be more entrepreneurial? Are they more interested in having more contact with the clients? Yeah, so I think this is what really interests me. I, uh, my original interest in the, just the whole topic of accounting labor, I started down that path because I don't really have an accounting background myself. I have a finance bachelor's degree, a finance master's degree. Uh, while I was at the University of Utah, I took an amazing financial statement analysis class from Christine Bodison, who's now the academic member of the Financial Accounting Standards Board. But it converted me. I decided I'm, I want a PhD and it's going to be in accounting. But then uh, in the years since then, I kind of have felt like an oddball in my discipline. I don't fit in. And it, it, it made me wonder, like, why? What, what are the traits that I have that are not kind of common among accountants? So I started to do research on what are the things that make a person attracted to an accounting career? And mm -hmm. I, I actually think this relates exactly to what you're talking about. And my guess is that you are also an oddball because you're I entrepreneurial. Am. So the the things that that really historically have attracted people to accounting are that it's very secure. Uh, the outcomes are not that variable. Mm -hmm. And um, it's like relatively well paid. So it's historically attracted a lot of people from low uh, socioeconomic status background. So if you if you're like a first generation college student, you're particularly likely to want to major in accounting. And the reason is you think you, you're going to college to get a good job. And accounting is kind of like a prototypical good it's, job. It's a sure thing. Yeah. But one of the things you're not looking for is to study something that you are deeply passionate about. And <laughs> you're not you're, you're not there to like figure out how you can best contribute something positive to humanity. It's a different set of values. It's like, I, I really want to ensure that I am secure. Um, okay, so... Uh, that means a lot of things, I think, about our discipline. But um, one of the things is that uh, risk preferences are associated with all of that stuff. So mm -hmm. we wind up with a bunch of people who are conservative. And um, <laughs> that I don't think those people um, are overrepresented among entrepreneurs. It's it, it, that because entrepreneurship is a riskier choice. So if you if you go through the accounting path, you're selecting out a bunch of risk takers and then in order to become a, an entrepreneurial accountant, you have to take risks. So it's an especially rare little group. And I, I actually sort of think I have a similar profile. I like doing risky research. Uh, and and I, I'm baffled by my colleagues who are just way, way too conservative about risk. But I think the reason that they're that way is that they chose to become accountants. And mm -hmm. they chose to become accountants because they did not want to take uh, risks with their they, career. They, they didn't want to take the risk. I, I, I get that. And, and that's that's why you end up with a lot of employees who, you know, they just want to be employees. They don't, they don't yes. want they, they I, I don't quite understand that mentality because to me, the the riskiest thing I've ever done was being an employee because you only have one client. Yeah. If you're an employee, you're you have one client. And if you lose that client, you got to go find another client. And in between, you don't have any money. And so I'm going, how is that? How is that less risky? But um, it's it, it it's so interesting to me that you have um, what you what you end up with is you end up with people, they'll go to like big four, they'll go to or a, a national firm and they'll they'll be there for two to five years. And of course, big four has always had an upper out, right? Yeah. You either make partner or you're done. There, there are no lifetime managers there. And, um, and so, so let's say you go out. Well, you, you, what you realize actually pretty quickly is you start talking to your buddies who've already gone out and they're going, I'm making twice as much as you are. Mm. And cause I have my own clients and buying a CPA firm is really easy and it's actually pretty cheap. You know, you can go buy the clients, buy the systems, et cetera. 
you know, you know, there's still some anxiety there, which is kind of the model behind the franchises. We take that anxiety away is that you don't have to learn how to market. You don't have to learn how to sell. We can do that. You know, you don't, you don't have to do that kind of stuff. You can just serve the clients, which is what you're doing anyway, but you can make two or three times as much money. So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's actually, in my mind, a pretty sweet business model for those who are maybe a little entrepreneurial, Right. But not like I'm going to go change the world, right? They're not they're, they're not the CEO of Baker Tilly, who, you know, who, who wants to go out and become make it the big five, right? Which is 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 clearly clearly his goal in life, um, which good for him. Um, but but my 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 question is: so if if we're not elastic, um, is that mean it's just going to shrink the profession, or what do you think that means? Um, if, if 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 this will it eventually break or will something else change it yeah i i think it's extremely hard to say that we, I, I you know everybody's concerned about the future and nobody knows what sort of ai what what kind of disruption we're um in store for and i so i'm i'm reluctant to make predictions the the sort of um idea about like low pay that is low because the audit firms have market power and they're a uh, oligopsony and they're keeping pay low. They don't have incentives to change it. Uh, and th like, that's the, the equilibrium that they have arrived at is that they're kind of colluding to keep prices low and they're benefiting by that. Um, sure. So when I try to picture what will happen, like the, the, the pressure points are um, the universities really. I, th I w when I think about who is under the most pressure, if if we're getting lower accounting enrollments, the audit firms don't like it and they're screaming about it. We need more people. We need more people. Um, the universities, when price remains too low, when we get fewer and fewer people majoring in accounting, the accounting departments start to get squeezed. We need right. more students. We need more students. Um, and you know, how do you get more students? The traditional answer is you pay them more. Uh, if, you know, um, people viewed alternatives to the big four as kind of viable, mm -hmm. popular career paths, I do think that that's a release valve. That's, a, you know, if you major in accounting, not thinking my only choice or my best choice or my obvious choice is to go to the big four uh, and, and pay is better in these other places, then, yeah, I can see that as um, something that would save the universities and be good for us. And it would also kind of put pressure on the big four. If they want talent, they're going to have to pay more because now they're competing um, in a in a more liquid or in kind of a more fair market. And, um, you know, pr supply and demand will determine price when there's competition. Yeah. Although you you, you brought something up when you, you, you just barely mentioned AI in that um, technology could easily replace all those people were missing. So, I mean, for example, I, I have, I, I have not the same compunction about uh, making predictions. I'll make the prediction. I think five years from now, there are no bookkeepers. Yeah. There's no need for it between blockchain AI. Um, we already have plaid. I mean, you, you already have the connections to, to actually set up your system. So it automatically downloads from your bank, um, you know, at, at midnight every night and the transactions get loaded in the right place and to the right spot. I mean, to me, I, I, I just, that's not, that's not even rocket science. I mean, yeah. to me, that's like, why isn't that here yet? Is, is it's that kind, it's so readily available to us. Yeah. Um, and then tax returns, similar, but audits are even more so because <laughs> blockchain is really an audit mechanism. That's all it is. It's just triple entry accounting. And so, so then can we have, could we have t uh, all data entry for tax returns done automated? Could we yeah. have, could we have audits done? I mean, why do we have people doing audits other than the review level, right? Why do we have people checking cash? I mean, I don't understand that at all. Um, and my understanding is big four is they, they are working on this um, to solve this. Um, but what do you think will be the impact of, of technology? How do you see that impact coming and how fast do you see it coming? You're listening to WealthAbility for CPAs, not just because Tom Wheelwright is entertaining, but to become a better strategic tax advisor. Attorney John Scabland and his law firm, Scabland PLLC, presents with Tom Wheelwright to accountants and works with tax advisors throughout the United States, implementing strategic tax plans that protect the client's assets. Take your expertise and client value to another level by working with John. Tax professionals rave about John's approach to asset protection. 
John enables your client to start small and increase the complexity of their plan as their assets grow. John will custom tailor a plan that is both affordable and effective. John Scabland is your asset protection attorney who will work with your tax strategy and within your client's budget. Go to ultimateassetprotection.com and schedule a time to meet with John. Yeah, so uh, this is like huge. And if I, if I knew I would make the right investments and retire on an island in 10 years, which, I, which <laughs> I, I'm not confident I'm gonna get this right. The things I think I can say though, are if, if the selling point of an accounting career has historically been, this is safe and secure, uh, AI being out there in the future and generating uncertainty eats that away. If, if the other um, selling point has been, your pay is gonna be good, but we're not giving raises to entry-level people, that kills that selling point as well. So in the immediate term, just the uncertainty, I think is especially bad for accounting. Another, another, okay, yeah. So um, if you look back at kind of the original computerization revolution, the same kinds of things were being thought. And I, there needs to be a research project on this. I, I, I'm trying to get one going, but it's hard to do historical research that and get it published in a good journal. But Basically, like the same arguments were being made. We're going to get these big mainframes. They're going to do all the calculation for us. They can do a lot of the work that clerks are doing, that, that bookkeepers are doing, or low-level accountants are doing. And it took like a lot longer than people thought it would, but it did in the end hollow out kind of the middle right. of it. You still need data entry. You still need analysis and judgment, but you need a lot less kind of grunt work, boring work. And that that's disruptive, but in a lot of ways that makes life better for a lot of accountants. Like they're no longer doing the drudgery part, they're doing the interesting part. And if I had to, my best model, my best tool for predicting the future is whatever happened in the past. So if I had to predict what's gonna happen with AI, I would say it's the same thing, uh, but you know, juiced up quite a bit. So you're gonna empty out the middle. Um, you end up with people at the very bottom doing the stuff that AI can't do, like entering, I don't, I don't really even know, but uh, data entry, I suspect, will always be a thing. Uh, and then because somebody has got to turn the page or whatever, like a, the, the machine has a hard time turning the page or whatever to scan it. And then, uh, you know, at the top level, you have people making judgments about, you know. Yeah, yeah but I, I didn't have clerical people scanning the documents in. I, I don't I don't I don't need an accountant for that. So my, oh, right. They're not an accountant. Exactly. No, my, yeah. my point is, is I think that data entry actually will be that entry by the machine, but it will actually be fed. Yes, it has to be fed there. By a person. Yeah. Probably. At but least, not a trained at least person. Temporarily. But but yeah. you're right. Not a trained person, not not yeah. a sophisticated person. So yeah. so it brings me to my next question, which is I believe we're gonna start. So I think the I, my solution is. Um, I actually think the technology is great because, like you say, it, it means we can do more interesting stuff. I mean, I prepared my first tax preparation job with a CPA firm. I was in uh, actually at University of Utah. And um, the one of the first questions the uh, partner asked me is that, uh, how's your handwriting? I said, well, what, what do you mean? He says, how's your handwriting? I said, well, it's actually really good. I actually spent a lot of time working on my handwriting. He says, well, good, because we actually fill in the tax returns by hand with pencil. Then we photocopy them and we send in the photocopy to the IRS. That's what we did in 1980. Okay. That's, that's how we did tax returns in 1980. And so, and since then, of course, now, you know, whether it's uh CCH or Thompson Reuters, whoever, right. W uh, it does all the calculations. Like you say, it does the middle part, right? I see that eventually with good OCR, um, it'll, it'll do the data entry as well. Um, mm -hmm. The IRS is going to screw it up. So it's going to take a lot longer for the, <laughs> For, for the tax side of it than it will for the bookkeeper side of it, I think. Um, but what I what I suspect is, is that we will actually have to change the profession. And that the old profession, which is the old, I'm a conservative accountant. And um, I, I, think, uh, I, I think it's gonna be taken over by the people who go, look, I wanna serve my clients. I want to work with entrepreneurs. I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to make more money. I want to work fewer hours. And, and I want to do more interesting work, which is analysis work, right? It's not data yeah. entry work. So I, to me, that's, that's the change. That's basically the revolution that has to happen in the industry. Yeah. I mean, I, I, uh, I think that's all reasonable. And, uh, 
I guess you're positioned so that you 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 will make your fortune when that happens and you can retire to your island. Maybe you could already retire to your island. <laughs> well, well, we we have made the decision that we are doing we are doing the software. We are you know, we're 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 creating uh, the, you know, we're creating the systems and all that kind of thing, because what we're finding is, so we went from, uh, one to 12 franchisees in three months. So that's how, uh, that's, I mean, that's like a, a record, um, yeah, for how fast to launch a franchise. And now granted we knew these people, right? So this isn't like we started from zero, right? It's an overnight success after 20 years is basically what it is. So we've been working in it, but at the same time, what we're finding is, is that the people who are uh, joining, uh, becoming franchisees, this tax advisory, uh, franchisee, um, they are, they're very entrepreneurial, but what they really want to do is they want to do interesting work, and they want to take care of clients and they're happy and they want to work with staff, but they don't want to do the recruiting. They don't want to do the, the billing collection. They don't want yeah. to do the, you know, set up all the systems They certainly don't want to do the sales and marketing. That that's, that's the number one thing they don't want to do, but they, but they are entrepreneurial enough that, but they do want to run the show. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, it makes a lot of sense to me. So, so one of the other things that I'm finding, and this is interesting, I'd like your take on this, is we have found, I found recently that, um, you know, historically, CPAs have really done three things, right? They've done accounting, bookkeeping, they've done auditing, and they've done tax. I mean, those are the three primary, primary things they do. Now I know that there's a lot of, you know, internal controls and, you know, forensic, there's all those special subspecialties. Um, but let's take the tax side of it. What I'm finding is, uh, first of all, the tax side of it's highly unregulated. Um, the audit side's highly regulated, but the tax side's actually highly unregulated. And what I'm finding is more and more non-CPAs that are naturally entrepreneurs. So mm -hmm. they're financial planners, they're insurance agents. These are people who are used to hunting <laughs> as, instead of farming, right? Yeah. They're hunters. And, and instead of being gatherers. And so what's happening is they're actually coming into the market because they're finding the CPAs. Uh, people keep complaining about their CPAs. My, why, why didn't my, the number one question I get is why didn't my accountant tell me that? Okay. Mm -hmm. so I'm, and I wrote my book, Tax Free Wealth. I'll, I'd love to send you a copy and see, get, get your thoughts on it. But we've sold almost half a million copies of it. So it's a, it's a fairly well-known book. And, uh, but people read it and go, I don't understand. Why didn't my CPA tell me this? Mm -hmm. What, 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 I mean, cause we're, I mean, we're not talking about sophisticated stuff. We're talking about, yeah. you know, how's the tax law basically work? I mean, it's, it's basically tax one-on-one. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I've never had a CPA read it and say, no, that's not right. Cause it is, it's, I mean, it's just, it's, <laughs> it's just the basic stuff. We just delivered it in an easy to read form. So, but my, 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 my question is, do you see that kind of, a, are you seeing that kind of evolution? Do you think that's something that uh, might happen is that the CPA profession becomes a much smaller profession because of all, all these dynamics you're talking about the 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 pay scale um you know it's it's not as interesting you've got technology do you see it shrinking as an industry i i uh, i'm i think that there are forces that resist it so uh, one of the things that i've studied is just the sociology of the professions. And, um, you know, there's a whole, there's a way of looking at it that is like a kind of a competitive market where you can get jurisdiction, you get control of some task and um, then you defend it. The profession defends it. And one of the ways they defend it is with licensing. So I think these kinds of things can protect a profession uh, because once you're a big profession, you can secure licensing for yourself then you can lobby the government to give you special powers and accounting has a lot of that and and i my understanding is it uses it pretty effectively so i do think change is coming and change is happening but the profession uh, th there is a reaction an adaptation to the new environment and if you think of it in that way um accounting the profession is positioned pretty well to defend itself i don't think things are going to stay the same things will change um already we're teaching different classes we're teaching all right. of the students at the University of Florida to code in Python and to do oh. kind of statistical analyses that we that was never part of accounting education in the past. And that's, I think, the beginnings of an adaptation to an AI world and kind of an analysis world. 
but you know <laughs> how it will go i have no clue and i mean i'm interested to hear your kind of um entrepreneurial uh, approach to taking advantage of these changes that's that's pretty cool I, I i can't say that my students are talking to me about those kinds of things but maybe that's coming interesting, In interesting. so so you're so are, are your do you see your students are the, have they changed much that i guess that's a question i've got outside of being you know obviously interested in technology um, have you seen the the nature of the student or the the type of person who comes in the accounting profession? You were talking about how it's historically been this conservative, you know, risk averse. I, I just want to do my work uh, type of a person. Have you seen that change at all in the last ten years? I'd say the only thing that I've really noticed is that I think um, it, I have some data that says that accountants tend to be people who don't care too much to do work that contributes to the world and does good. I think that's changed a lot. I think the the new generation cares and cool. it affects what job they'll take and what compromises they'll they'll take to take the job. You know, uh, my students, the, the masters of accounting students here almost all go to the big four, but I don't think they are going thinking that's what they want to do in the long run. I think right. they see it as like the next- A stepping stone. A stepping stone. It's like the last phase of their training once they put in a couple of years there, they're going to go on to what they actually want to do. And I think the big change is that that next step, what they actually want to do involves doing good more than it, more than it used to. Interesting. Interesting. So a uh, final question for you, um, cause you, you brought this up and that is okay. how do we, uh, will it, it, will students start to look at non big four? So, I, for example, my, my, my business partner, the, the one who runs my accounting firm. So I have an accounting firm and I have a technology firm. I have different companies, but the, the, my partner who runs the technology firm, she's a millennial and she came out of the university of Illinois with a master's of tax degree, but came to us, um, mm -hmm. as a small firm in Arizona, um, somebody in, in our firm knew, you know, knew the professors over there and she actually came straight out from really a top top-notch school, yeah. University of Illinois with a master's degree, master's yeah. of tax degree, and came to a small firm. What do you think it's going to take to, to have that be a legitimate option for people? Is it is it just going to be the pay has to be that much higher or the work has to be that much different? Yeah, I, I mean, this is a great question. I think about this kind of a lot. There, there is a whole, so at a place like the University of Illinois or the University of Texas or the University of Florida, there's a whole recruiting infrastructure that, in, right. like pretty directly funnels the students into those firms yep into just a subset of firms that are that have a long standing recruiting relationship with the university so at those universities i think it's it's going to be hard to break the hold and it would be a gradual process however some of my research is about diversity in accounting and one of the things i can tell you from that research is that audit firms have been recruiting from the same universities for mm. like 50 years and they're leaving a lot of talent on the table. And that talent is especially concentrated at universities where they don't recruit, which are the universities that tend to have a lot of minority students. So mm -hmm. one of, I think if, if I'm a non big four accounting employer and I wanna get uh, like talent that's been left on the table, I go to those universities. And I, I think to, to me, that's where there's flexibility and change is possible. And I think there's wasted talent on the table. Um, Interesting. Not wasted exactly, but the big four are definitely not hiring uh, the best and the brightest they could because they oh. are under recruiting at a bunch of schools. It, it, it's kind of like when you're watching a, an NFL, you know, you, you, we'll be, we're watching, uh, you know, you're watching the Super Bowl and you see where somebody, what school they went to, and you go, where is that school? Because yeah, yeah. somewhere along the line, some talent scout picked this person out of this um FBS college, this, the, the, the smaller, the smaller, uh, college or university. Yeah. And they go, this person has so much talent. They yeah. just evolved later in life. Probably they, they weren't an early recruit. You know, they weren't a Nick Saban yep. in, in the Nick Saban, uh, camp where they came up since they were 10. Um, but rather that, you know, they ended up at, at you know, Marshall, you know, they yep. ended up some, someplace, um, I mean, you've got a couple of schools down in Florida that have just done exceptionally well over the last few years in football as an example, and they've been pulling people 
that, you know, the University of Florida wouldn't look at, Florida State wouldn't yep. look at. So um, it, that's a really interesting comment. I think that's uh, I, I think that's really true. And one of the things we have noticed in our in our network and and our franchise is that um, it is a very diverse group. It is an extraordinarily diverse group. We don't have a whole lot of um, old white white guys like me. Hmm. I mean, seriously, I'm the only old white guy. Um, everybody else is, uh, typically we find them, they're, uh, typically millennials and, um, and they're younger and they're diverse and they, they are anxious to learn, um, that there's no entitlement going on, which I think, uh, with the big, bigger schools, there, there tends to be some entitlement. So, yeah. um, this is really interesting. So, uh, if you would, uh, give our, um, listeners, our viewers, just, uh, two or three, steps that you think they could take to attract better talent? Oh, man, as as sort of employers hiring accounting grads? Yep. yep. Yeah. Okay. Well, I have an opinion about this. I, I think um, there's a, okay, one thing that I think they ought to be doing, you, you, the big four try to pretend uh, with their advertising sometimes that um, they'll have like a picture of a guy with a surfboard and they're on Cal yeah. they're in California. And it's like, I work for Deloitte and I'm a, sur I'm a cool surfer person. Right, right. And I think this is, this is the wrong thing. That's not what they're offering. So um, th they're really advertising something they're not going to offer to students who don't think they're going to get that from the big four. So the interesting thing about your question is that you probably are um, asking me to talk to people who are doing offering more interesting work than the big four does. So For honestly, sure. if you, I, I am 100% sure that young accounting graduates want meaningful, interesting work, and they don't think they're going to get that at the big four. So if you can credibly claim this job is going to do good in the world, and this job is going to be sort of stimulating to you. And this job is going to reward you for your time so that you can spend your other time doing the things you are, are passionate about that are not accounting. I think that the, the students are, are starving for that. They all want that. And many of them think they can't have that until they've passed through the big four. Um, and if that's not true, you should tell them that. <laughs> the, the second thing no, I'd I, say is- I, I love that. The second thing is I, I, I definitely am convinced that the big four are recruiting um, from a set of schools they chose 50 years ago because they were white. And- that means yeah. that if you go to a university that does does not is not on that list, um, there the top people from that university are going to be just as good as like the top half of people at the most elite schools. But they're not being aggressively recruited by the big four, and the university is not teaching them that that's the only path for them. So, if if I were just hiring a few CPAs um, and I was not the big four, I would go to off the beaten path universities, and I would try to hire their top two students. Okay, so fi final question for you, which is going back to the original um, statement okay. you made, which is um, the CPA profession doesn't pay enough. Yeah. From a pay scale standpoint, if the average is 56,000 starting, yeah. to go to big four, presumably that's what you're talking about, so, so, let's make it easy, let's say it's 60, what kind of differential gets somebody's attention who could go to big four, but goes, wait a minute, it's enough different that I'm willing to look at this company. Yeah, I, I think you have to, it has to sound to them like they're getting a better financial deal. So the, the comparisons they're making are, what are my friends who are going to the big four gonna earn? What are my friends who are going to the non big four gonna earn? And then what are my friends in information systems going to earn? Yeah. And um, the more sophisticated ones might also be thinking, what am I going to earn in four years if I spend three of those years at the at the big four? So I'm not sure exactly what these numbers are, but they're they're significantly higher than 60,000. Um, well, it's a good and, point because it's not just how much am I earning coming out, but what's my potential earning? Um, because, you know, big four, I mean, obviously you make partner, you're making good money. Um, yes. So they do make good money. Um, they're, they're like some of the most highly paid employees on earth, um, which a partner at Big Four is a highly paid employee. I, I, I hope none of our listeners think that um, if you're a partner in a big firm that you're anything other than a highly paid employee because you're right. And I mean, 
You are not an owner. You're not an entrepreneur. You are not an owner. You are (laughs) simply a highly paid employee with a little more say than, uh, than your staff has in what goes on, but not a whole lot more. So um, I just want to, Paul, I want to really thank you um, for this. Um, This is terrific information. And I think that is very, very useful if somebody wanted more information and uh, about what you're doing and, and what your studies are, where would they go? University of Florida website. I have a website that lists my research. Uh, a bunch of it that's not published yet is, is on a website called SSRN, which is the Social Science Research Network. It's oh. a great place to find kind of the cutting edge research. Um, and, you know, if, if, if you want to, you just send me an email. Then my email's on my website. Awesome. Thank you, um, Dr. Paul Matson from the University of Florida. Uh, just remember, everyone, if, if we don't have good, um, if we don't have good professionals, um, we don't make any money, frankly, and we do all the work. So uh, we, we really do have to pay more. Uh, but in order to pay more, we have to, um, we, we actually have to uh, charge more. And in order to charge more, we're going to have to do more for our clients. Uh, because what it all comes down to is better clients, better practice, and a better life. We'll see everyone next time. You've been listening to the Wealth Ability for CPA show. Better clients, better practice, better life. To learn more, go to wealthability.com. <laughs>